around uh, before Christmas time in December, my uncle Jerry passed away. He was 61. He's my dad's uh, younger brother. He died of COVID. Uh, I've actually had four members of my family die of COVID in the last like 10 months. Um, so, but uh, I'll read a few poems here. This is uh, my, my uncle actually was mayor of the town uh, that he grew up in for one term. Um, but if you wanted to find him for city business, you had to go to a bar in town called Lee's Bar. And there was a phone on the bar top. And um, yeah, I can remember going there with, with him as a boy. And this is called A Typical Thursday Night at Lee's Bar. I'll take my, I'll take my bifocals off for this. A Typical Thursday Night at Lee's Bar. My uncle sitting there with a bottle of Stonies, telling jokes and avoiding phone calls from work and women who had less teeth than they did in some faded high school prom photo. How many of them are gone now? Once talking loudly over the jukebox about the fast girls over at the Eagles Lodge who were just giving it away. And this, let's see, I've got like three poems I wrote for him that are in here. I'll read this. Um, this is, uh, in some ways, it will always be 1982. <laughs> A homemade birthday cake, more Pepsi than you could ever drink. My brother letting out his first loud screams before taking a vow of silence only talking with guitar strings now, a Star Wars belt buckle around my waist, Isley's chipped ham instead of awful food, everyone still here. Nice. And this is just sort of a funny poem, but I'll read it anyway. Um, you, know, you, go on, you know, you go on YouTube and they always recommend things for you. And one day I went on there and they recommended that I might like to watch this video about semen retention. <laughs> and, and I have no idea like, why that would even happen. But uh, this is just a poem called YouTube suggests a video on semen retention. You, YouTube suggests a video on semen retention as if saying they know I can't get laid on a Friday night. So I better not even think about it. And instead go outside and run my fingers through the soil, grass and moonlight, holding in everything that was never meant to go to seed. Mm. I live in the South right now and it's very hot. And over the summer, the bees are out all the time and they're always trying to sting me. And um, I just got really angry about it over this past summer. And I was trying to burn them to death with a grill lighter. <laughs> and uh, I wrote this poem for Jason. It's called Setting a Wasp on Fire. It's a great poem. I think about it. How the Roman dead love their children once. How we're not special. How flesh burns just as well in any century. As I aim a grill lighter straight at the heart of a red carpenter wasp. As crazed drivers venture down the county route to get their medicine. My grandmother would have said that B could be the ghost of George Floyd. Just looking for a torch. So be gentle with death. It is more than just the anniversary of our bones. It's called Bell, Missouri, a rose by any other name. The Ku Klux Klan drops off pamphlets at our local bookstore and nobody says anything. And people are dying in the streets for nothing, dying in their homes for nothing. When there are flowers planted right outside my house and it's their color that makes them beautiful. Hmm. Um, but I, this is a poem I wrote for my younger brother, um, who is obsessed with the movie Easy Rider. Um, I'm a fan of it, too. Uh, I went to film school. 
uh, but it's his favorite movie. And it's uh, the poem's called Captain America and Billy. Hmm. At 14, my brother was obsessed with Easy Rider and the soft purr of a Rickenbacker bass. Hog heaven was the scent of gasoline and perfume and the roar of engines on a small screen. We drank Mad Dog 2020 out of paper bags under the old movie theater sign with its letters dangling like a long forgotten ransom note. He was Captain America, I was Billy, and George Hansen rolled into one. And Steppenwolf was still the bird song of modern myth. And before I maxed out my credit cards, we'd eat huge dinners in a strip mall TGI Fridays and fill ourselves with red wine in the middle of the afternoon, imagining we were in the French Quarter or at least a few counties over, not wanting to think about the coming winter or that we might never end up going anywhere at all. Yes. Cool. Oh, yeah. I, I, I wrote this poem for S.A. Griffin. Um, we were at a bar. I used to live in Toledo, Ohio. We were at a bar there called the Charleston, <laughs> which is the dirtiest, grimiest, like hooker bar that you could find in the whole town. And we went there because we were looking for a dirty bar to use in a movie. And it's kind of the grimiest place we could find. And as we were leaving in that yellow Cadillac, uh, we had a bunch of prostitutes come out onto the street and run after us. They were like, hey, pimps, come back. So I wrote this poem for him. Uh, it's called A Yellow Cadillac as a Passport to Solicitation. <laughs> in Toledo, we listened to Neil Young outside a bar where a prostitute chased us into the street. In West Virginia, we drove past storefront windows that harbored hate groups in search of chili dogs. In the Ohio River Valley, you stole some fucked up ceramic dinnerware from behind a dumpster where they had been guarding the dead for generations. And that, that's true. SA found all these cases of like slightly damaged Fiesta wear and took them on an airplane with him back to Los Angeles over the place. Um, but when I was back there last, which was last summer, um, he played me some of his songs and I was really excited because he doesn't really talk to many people. He's really shy. And, and then when he played the songs, they were about women, but in a really way that in a way that was like ultra derogative. <laughs> and uh, I was disappointed and, because I like women and um, I just didn't feel that they were songs by someone who liked women, which was made me sad. Uh, but this is a song. This is a poem called songs about vaginas. At 37, my brother struts like Ted Nugent in our parents' basement just like he did back in high school. It's like he's trapped in a time machine shaped like a muscle car full of regrets. The women he sings about have never been real. They've never shopped for groceries or, fumble, or fumbled around for loose change on the Pennsylvania Turnpike only to have it all lead to nowhere. Um, when, uh, when they were issuing the first stimulus package, um, I read an article that said they sent, um, I think it was 1.1 million checks, uh, stimulus checks to people that were already dead. Um, and it had totaled $1.4 billion. And so somehow I felt like that there was a poem in that and that I needed to write it down. Um, and this is a poem called Stimulus Checks for the Dead. More than a million ghosts will eat better than you tonight, sleeping along the borders of history, of moon landings, of great speeches of empathy, not tear gas, not children in cages, not batons across the neck of a river. The dead don't need our help. 
The dead never wear face masks. The dead keep everything off the books. The dead bump into each other in the clouds. The dead give Eskimo kisses to the dead. The dead are a pile of worry. The dead are a mountain of regrets. The dead are a great poem. The dead are a bad poem. The dead are a beautiful girl who will never grow old. The dead are a warm foxhole. The dead are a great love story. The dead are your mother's broken heart. The dead are your father's missed opportunities. The dead are a friend you couldn't save from the dead. The dead went to your high school. The dead puked in your car. The dead lost their virginity to the dead. The dead died of cancer. The dead died of heart attacks. The dead died of AIDS. The dead died because of their skin color. The dead died for the right to love anyone they want. The dead died of hunger. The dead died of loneliness. The dead were murdered by the dead. The dead hum Gershwin in concentration camps. The dead loved you with all their hearts. The dead sometimes said things they didn't mean. Words, man. And this poem is a true story. I was in Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco and I was just kind of out of it because I was there with a reading promoter that was fighting with his girlfriend and I had a bad headache and I nearly wound up stepping in front of a streetcar. Um, came within an inch of like dying and some girl like pulled me by the shirt and pulled me back and uh, saved my life. Uh, this is uh, the prettiest girl in Fisherman's Wharf. The prettiest girl in Fisherman's Wharf places her hand on my shoulder to keep my absent-minded legs from stepping in front of an oncoming streetcar. Her fingers, long and cool like the summer breeze, remind me that I don't yet want to die alone or take the form of a dying bird. I want to love her just long enough to get for a beer to get warm just long enough to mean it. Um, and um, I wrote a few prettiest girl poems about girls that I met in England. Um, and this, this is one of those. This is called The Prettiest Girl in Paddington Square. And what I've told people about this collection you know, they automatically thought it was just about attractive people, which is really shallow. Um, <laughs> it's definitely more, more as much to do with inner beauty than anything else. Because um, I myself am not an attractive person. I don't feel like I have the right to judge anyone. So <laughs> uh, this is uh, the prettiest girl in Paddington Square. The prettiest girl in Paddington Square has jagged teeth and a thick Cockney accent, the only thing her grandmother ever left her. She wears a locket with a picture of a dead father she never even knew to cover a small tattoo of a rose along the base of her neck. By day, she pours beer and smiles talking about her boyfriend. And by night, she is the most beautiful flower in Brixton. She is the cry of a barn owl that once thought it might die alone, her heart tucked away and dreaming out of sight to almost everyone. Okay, and I'll finish with this, this tiny poem. I grew up around Pittsburgh and when I was six or seven, I was at a carnival or an amusement park, I can't remember which, and there was this really beautiful girl who must have been about 15 or 16 at that time who uh, gave me this giant blue stuffed dog and because she told me it matched my eyes and um, I kept that dog on the end of my bed until I finished college and uh, I knew her for like all of 10 minutes and have never seen her since but I wrote this poem it's the prettiest girl in Pittsburgh Pennsylvania the prettiest girl in Pittsburgh Pennsylvania hands me a stuffed blue dog at a carnival, saying it matches my eyes. It's been over 30 years and still no smile can measure up to hers. 
no moonlight was meant to go on this long unrequited. Mm. 